Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 235. We're going to pretty much dedicate the entire episode today to an important type of genealogical record, and that is the federal records. These are records that you've probably heard about, but you may have not dug into yet, or maybe have even shied away from a little bit. You know, each time we venture into a new area of genealogical research, it it brings up a whole other set of terminology, um, background, history, and then you have to figure out where all these records are and the best way to go about accessing them. Well, I have the right person here today to help us with all of this. Michael Strauss, who is a professional forensic genealogist and just happens to be our military minutes man here at Genealogy Gems. He is back to share his expertise in this really important area of genealogical record research. Michael's going to talk about all the different types of records that are out there, the kinds of information that you're going to find, and he's got some great examples so you can really see how this applies to your own family history research. We have an awful lot to cover, so may I suggest be sure and visit the show notes page for this episode. I put together comprehensive show notes for you that really detail out everything that we're talking about in today's episode. You might even want to, if you're listening at home, maybe print it out and kind of follow along and make your own notes. Uh, But just know if you're listening in the car or you're mowing the lawn or you're exercising, whatever it is you're doing as you listen to the Genealogy Gems podcast, um, make a mental note that you're going to want to head to the show notes for this episode and take a look at all the great written material, because that's material you're going to be able to reference as you are going about your research and digging into these amazing federal records. You can find the show notes for Genealogy Gems podcast episode 235 at our website. You go to genealogygems.com and under podcast in the menu, you go to the Genealogy Gems podcast and just navigate your way to episode number 235. Click the link and you'll find all the show notes there. And of course, I hope you're listening on the Genealogy Gems podcast app, and there you will find all your show notes as well. So now that you're all set, you've got all the written material to refer to, let's dive right in and talk federal records with Michael Strauss. How does it make you feel when I say, Have you tracked down all the federal records for your ancestors? You're not alone if your anxiety level just went up a little bit. (laughs) Federal records sound great because they're so packed with genealogical information, but getting down to brass tacks is another thing. Knowing what's available, where to find those records, that those can be obstacles that stop many genealogists from ever tapping into them. So Today, our aim is to fix all that. Professional forensic genealogist Michael Strauss is here to pull back the curtain and introduce you to these federal records. Now, you know Michael from our Military Minute segments here on Genealogy Gems, and he recently introduced us to Descendancy Research on Genealogy Gems premium podcast episode 174. Today, he's here to talk federal records. Welcome back to the show, Michael. Uh, Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you having me back. I'm really looking forward to talking about this because it is a topic that I think sometimes strikes fear in the heart of genealogists. I mean, we have good intentions, but when it really comes down to, okay, so what are the federal records encompass and where are they going to be and all that kind of stuff, that can be challenging. And, you know, we got a great response from our conversation on descendancy research. You really opened up a whole new avenue of research for our ancestors with that. That was a lot of fun. Well, and with federal records, I think the key to it that uh, for genealogists to understand is that these are really a a relatively untapped resource. Exactly. So you introduced us to descendancy research. Now we're going to jump into federal records and let's start with federal. Now, when I think federal, I think, oh, this is going to be at the federal level in terms of I'm going to need to go to this one federal location. Maybe it's Washington, D.C. Maybe it's the National Archives in another location. Are all federal records held 
in that kind of a way? Or could we find federal records at state levels? Give us a sense of where these things are. Okay, well, as as the name implies, obviously, it is federal court records. So those records are going to be held in the custody of the uh, actual federal courthouses uh, and initially. So mm-hmm. when, when the records were created at the time they were created, uh, whenever that was in time, they were held initially at the federal courts where the events occurred. But obviously, with the creation of the National Archives in 1934, those records slowly started to make their way into the National Archives uh, record system. The the archives would record them and keep the archival files that were initially at the federal courts and then were turned over to the National Archives eventually. Now, uh, it's important to note, though, that the National Archives in Washington, D.C., we're all familiar with that one. That is Archives 1. But the regional archives, there are almost a dozen of them uh, scattered across the country. They will also hold their own federal court records as well, geographically, uh, by their area. And I I love that you (laughs) were able to explain that so succinctly, because I have talked to people, particularly when they're new into genealogy, and they'll hear, oh, well, I heard that there were some national archives or some federal records in, you know, St. Louis or whatever. And, And it starts to get convoluted, I think, in their head that, oh, well, maybe I'm supposed to be digging around in different states or whatever. But we're really talking about the National Archives system. And yes, they are located around the country, aren't they? Right, they are. So uh, the one in, you, you mentioned St. Louis. Well, St. Louis actually is the National Personnel Records Center. Yes. That's the military center. But on the other side of the state in Kansas City, Missouri, is a federal National Archives regional branch. And of course, they would cover the states of Missouri and some of the surrounding states. So you'll need to search their federal court records that they have at their local facility. Excellent. Okay, so as we're going to talk about the different types of records, help me understand, are all of these indexed, listed, whatever, on the National Archives website? Is there one place to go? Is that the place to go to kind of see the kinds of records we're about to talk about? Well, that's kind of a misnomer a little bit, I think. Um, with With the federal indexes for these records, yes, they are certainly indexed, but what has not found its way online as of yet are the master indexes for these different types of courts within the, the court system. The, um, the indexes themselves are going to be found at the individual level where, they're, where these records were actually uh, put together, where, they were, where the files were actually created. So it's going to be a little bit of a, a little harder, I think, to a challenge, I should say, a little bit more of a challenge to be able to access the records. But once you're able to do it and get an understanding of it, it it will make the research that much easier. And you can see, I get lots of questions. And it's not always a new genealogist, but I get lots of these kinds of clarifying questions. And so I'm really glad we're going through this because I think that will help people kind of get secure in their mind. You know, we'll go to the National Archives website to learn about the records, what's available, where to get them, that kind of thing. But as you're saying, we're not going to always find master index lists and that kind of thing. We're going to have to to dig a little deeper. And one thing you may want to consider your listeners to do is when they get into the records themselves, each of these federal courts are going to be found in record groups. And just get the finding aid for the record group. And and that's online. That's free and online. And that will at least point you in the right direction where to get the indices. Perfect. Okay. And and we'll have some links as, as you're listening to this. Just know that there's the show notes page on our website. And so we'll have links to lots of the different um, resources that we're talking about. So before we dig any further into where we would find things, because we know they're going to be in some different locations, but you've given us a sense of the organization. Let's talk about the types of federal court records that we might find. Well, it should be noted that the federal court system of the United States was really established under what was called the Judiciary Act of 1789. Uh, I would recommend that your readers uh, actually read the act. Uh, You can find it online on uh, the Library of Congress's website. They've scanned and digitized all the statutes at large. And this was passed on September 24th of 1789. That's, I think that's the first thing you should do is at least familiarize yourself with the the uh, introduction in our country of the federal court system before breaking into what each court represented. 
because that really gives you a basic understanding of the records. What was driving the creation? I know we've been talking to some folks uh, lately. We had Elisa Scalise Powell on and she was talking about, you know, why were these records created? And that's kind of what you're talking about, right? It's the history. Right. You have to have that. Yeah. You, you must have that to gain a firm understanding of these records. Are these divided up into different categories? What What are we looking at in terms of court records? Well, there are basically four types of federal court records. There are what are called district courts. These essentially are the trial courts of the United States, and they would have uh, jurisdiction over such uh, subgroups such as admiralty court, equity, bankruptcy. They even covered naturalization. Now, they would begin at different dates, and it was dependent on the geographic area of the United States as they were created when states were created. The second was the circuit courts. Now, the circuit courts were initially established in 1789 along with that act, and you could read about that. They were expanded later by 1866. That expanded to nine from initially three, but they covered a larger area. And they uh, covered uh, all matters of federal court, especially criminal records, and uh, that was all covered by federal law. Now, they were abolished, though, in 1911, and they were taken over by the district court. So the two really work hand in hand. And then you have uh, the last two, which are the Circuit Court of Appeals. This was established in 1891, and it acquired uh, appellate jurisdiction by the circuit and the district courts, and that court heard appeals on cases from both the district and the circuit court. So if a judge rendered a decision and and the defendant or whoever was being sued was not uh, amenable to the decision, they could appeal that process, and that was heard in the circuit court of appeals. And finally, the fourth would be, of course, the Supreme Court. This is the highest court in our land in the uh, federal court system, and again, was established in 1789. So when you were talking about the Circuit Court of Appeals, so this is an example of where somebody might have a local level criminal case, but it might make its way up to that. Is that correct? That is correct. So even though we think of it as a local situation, it may have escalated, and it may then end up in federal records. Right. And if something happened where the defendant, if it was a criminal case, uh, and they they did appeal the decision rendered by the judge, that might actually wind up in another court in another state, based on the fact that the appeals process would take into account the, the geographic uh, areas, because the circuit courts of appeals had different geographic jurisdictions than did the... Um, than did the regular federal courts. Well, as you can hear, there are a lot of potential federal records out there perfect for your family history research. Coming up right after this break, Michael will be back and he's going to tell us the particular type of federal records that he thinks are the richest. And he's going to tell you which local records to look for that can help lead you to those federal records. That's coming up right after this. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Now back to my conversation with Michael Strauss. Give us an example. We're looking at our family tree and we're thinking, well, I don't know if my family was involved in anything. What's a a simple example of something that 
people would go, oh, yeah, that, I suppose that could have happened in my family. I could go looking for that. You mean uh, a, a particular circumstance where someone would have been tried in the federal courts? Is that what you're referring exactly. to? Exactly, yes. Well, you could be tried for any number of reasons in the federal court. I have found in my research that I, I hate to say this, but uh, but I will. I'm just going to be blunt. Uh, I have found that some of the richest records in the federal court system actually come from the criminal records. Uh, our ancestors were not <laughs> were not all uh, all good in some <laughs> regards, and you might find some real interesting black sheep stories within your family uh, trees by looking at federal court records like that. My grandfather is an example of one of those instances where he was arrested and charged with a federal crime, and this was in the 1940s. Wow. So if somebody hasn't necessarily come across, like, let's say, a newspaper article that flags them to the fact that maybe one of their ancestors got into some trouble, but they know these ancestors have lived in this area, you know, for a long time. Would it be cumbersome, almost not even a good use of time, to try to go to the National Archives and and search with whatever they have available for us to do the searching, just to see if any of our ancestor names pop up? Is it better to have something that flags you and leads you and that's how you know it's time to, to invest that time at the National Archives? Or is it really not so hard that it's worth going ahead and make the trip and, and take a look? I definitely don't think you're, anyone's wasting their time by searching these records. If if nothing else, you become familiar with a set of records that you had not had much experience with before. Right. That in its that in itself is a plus. But if you uh, if you think about it in its simplest form, I believe most of the federal court files that you're going to find uh, reference to are going to wind their way in other records. You said newspapers. You specifically mentioned that, mm -hmm. and that's important because my grandfather's record, I would have never been turned on to the fact that my grandfather had a federal uh, file in the criminal courts had it not been for the fact that I found him in a newspaper listing. Ah, uh, right. And that led me to the next step, which was to find the records at the federal court, which, which in turn was at the National Archives. Right. So it might be that... Um you know, it's definitely worth making the trip, but even better if you find something else that gives you a little indicator, hey, there might be more here, then that's kind of what you're looking for is little indications in newspapers or journals or whatever, maybe some legal documents in our family collection that alert us to the fact that there might have been something more to dig for. Absolutely. There are lots of ways that you can find this information that you would get clues, little clues that would lead you to believe that you have a federal court record in one of those types of courts. Okay, so let's say we see a newspaper article and we realize, oh my gosh, there is a court case here. I'm going to go track this down. What kinds of records are we going to find within one of these cases? Well, there's going to be a lot of different types of records. The first thing you're going to want to look at, and you probably would have an interest in, are called the dockets. Now, these are sometimes referred to as court calendars, and they would have listed the cases heard by the federal courts themselves. So dockets are going to be a big help. If you find the dockets, you're going to want to look next at the minutes. These are brief daily accounts that are held and kept by the clerks that recorded all the action that was taken by the court. So if there was an appeal made or if there was a, a new judge appointed, something, anything that happened, these would be recorded in the minutes. There were, of course, orders. These were specific judgments that were rendered by the court ordering something uh, to be uh, mandated by the federal government. An example, a, a perfect example of that is an order granting citizenship naturalization falls in line with federal records. So you can think of it that way. There are also uh, briefs. These are legal documents that argued why one party should prevail over another on a, a case. And then that kind of dovetails nicely into what are called mandates. Mandates are obviously, uh, they're frequently seen in the criminal courts. And it essentially means when the defendant uh, in the criminal matter, 
obligates themselves to um, engage in activities in exchange for the suspension of their initial sentence. Now, all those things together make up only a portion. Each of them it, it takes in a part of that. But the, the by far the largest of those types of records are what are called case files. Now, these can be loosely bundled. They could be tied, rubber band. These are loose documents that all consist of the file relating to your ancestor that you had found that case file on. So those are really the basic types of records, and there are a lot of them. Right. When, when you go to the National Archives, are you going to be able to sit down at a database that has the index on it that you can search? How manual is this search? Well, it's going to be manual in the sense that you may have to go deeper into the finding aids and then request the indices. And then once you request the indices and you look at the record, I did this in Philadelphia years ago. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I did this in the, the Philadelphia National Archives branch. I was interested in a bankruptcy file, bankruptcies, federal court. And I was interested in finding one of my ancestors. So I was, while I was there, I couldn't just say, okay, I want the bankruptcy file for for this individual and I named the person. It doesn't work that way. You, I didn't even know there was a file at all, so I had to look at the index first. I requested the index. They brought the index books out to me. Once I found the name, I got the corresponding file information. Then I requested the file itself, and I was able to see the record. So that's, it, that's really how easy it is. That's good to know. Does that take a little bit of um, planning ahead? Do we need to contact them ahead and let them know, or will they be able to address those requests the same day? No, uh, the National Archives is really set up to answer your requests at the day that you are there. You don't need to have any appointment ahead of time. It's really not, it's really not set up that way at the National Archives. They will pull the records as you request them. Now, keeping in mind, if you have a record uh, that is in a different record group, so say your index is in record group 21, but the file falls in another record group, then you have to have the understanding that you may not get it at the same time. You have to request different record groups at different pull times. Mm -hmm. They don't allow for the same record, different record groups to be pulled at the same exact moment. You have to wait till the next pull time. Oh, interesting. So they have their own internal schedule. Yeah, that's just that's just internally. Mm -hmm. But there is no reason why a, a genealogist or any patron visiting the archives couldn't really walk out of the archives without what they are seeking. Well, good. So you're just kind of helping demystify, you know, this process if this is new for somebody. Oh, uh, absolutely. Wonderful. So we, we've talked about the different courts. And we know now there's um, several different types of records the dockets, the minutes, the orders, that kind of thing that are going to, we're going to be asking and looking at. Sounds like some of them may be originals, correct? They are. Yeah. Absolutely are originals. You're not, some of this has been filmed, uh, very little, but uh, for the most part, you're going to be looking at the original documents. You're going to get to touch the papers and see the signatures of your ancestors, which to me is just awesome. Oh, it's totally awesome. I mean, and there's so many records now, we're, we're so thrilled to have access to them. Uh -huh. And they're so efficient to search because they're in databases. But there's nothing like really working with original documents is there. Absolutely, I agree. All right. So now we've talked about our different types of records. Anything else that we need to think about in terms of understanding the geographic jurisdictions? Anything else we need to be prepared? Well, just one other thing that I wanted to make mention of that, uh, the, for the most part, the National Archives is set up by record groups. Um, I probably should tell you that, and this is going to be no surprise to you, the National Archives was really never set up for genealogists. Right. It was, it was not, well, and I, I, know, I know you're completely shocked by that, but it's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not the case. So uh, as it was, the National Archives was set up to do research differently, and everything is organized into different record groups. So the, for the most part, the court records from the district court and the circuit courts are essentially going to be found in record group 21. That's going to be your housed main record group. Now, there are going to be Supreme Court records, which will be in record group 267. The Court of Appeals will be in record group 276. Now, you see the difference between the numbers. So if you need to look at more than one record group, 
just request them separately, individually, different pool times. Mm -hmm. And then the last one you may want to consider that a lot of people don't know about is the U.S. Court of Claims. And that is in Record Group 123. Uh, That's actually uh, in a unique record group other than the others that I had mentioned. And the Court of Claims essentially was claims against the United States. So this was where individual citizens could file claims against the U.S. This court was actually established in 1855, and it was established at a time when some Mexican-American war veterans were trying to file claims against the federal government. I believe it dealt with uh, their pensions or with land that Mm -hmm. related to their military service. Interesting. So there again, it's so helpful to understand kind of the history of it. So you'll know what you're getting into and whether or not you need to explore that particular area. Absolutely. You bet. So you talked about a variety of cases. You mentioned admiralty court and uh, certainly criminal cases and naturalization records. What else should we know and be aware of when it comes to the variety of different cases that there are? Well, because there are so many subgroups found within the federal court system, you need to know which direction you're going. So if you're if you're looking for something that relates to someone having filed bankruptcy, you're clearly not going to look in a criminal record as they have their own section of the federal court records. So anyone who had financial troubles could possibly have filed bankruptcy for themselves or if if it was related to maritime affairs, you know, anything relating to seafaring and that sort of thing, it's going to be found within the records of Admiralty Court. So I think it's important to understand and at least know which direction you're going based on the type of file that you're looking for, what the subject matter is. You mentioned bankruptcy, and that seems like an area where we might be surprised, but maybe not so surprised to know that That could have affected anybody, right? I mean, how common has bankruptcy been over the decades and centuries? Oh, it's been extremely common. And uh, I mean, if you want to talk a little bit more deeper about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Bankruptcy itself essentially has was uh, created as part of our constitution it was a was passed by congress initially in in the early years of the republic and there are four national bankruptcy acts that have been passed over time the very first occurred in the year 1800 the second was in the year 1841 the third act was in 1867 and the fourth act was in 1898 now we are currently under the fourth act Obviously, it's been amended since 1898, but we're still under the umbrella of that fourth act. Now, all these acts have one thing in common, every one of them. They all followed some sort of business disturbance or some sort of downturn in the economy. So going back to that list, 1800, there was a business disturbance in 1797, uh, essentially a panic, if you will. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1841, there was the Panic of 1837 that immediately preceded that. 1867, well, it's pretty clear to see what happened there. That was the Civil War. The Civil War had occurred just a couple of years earlier, and there was a recession that followed. And then finally, the 1898 Act followed what was called the Business Panic of 1893. So all these followed some sort of downturn in our economy. That makes a lot of sense. And so somebody listening might be thinking, well, I think I mostly have farmers in my background. And we think of business as being, you know, people lived in big cities, but that wouldn't necessarily always be the case, would it? It could affect farmers. Absolutely. It could affect anyone, anyone who had any sort of dealings with creditors or, or anybody that owed money and debts to anyone. If they could not pay their obligations, they had the options to file for bankruptcy. When I searched that Philadelphia record when I was looking years ago, it was actually for my fourth great grandfather. His name was George Waltz. And I was searching for him because I was led to believe from a newspaper article that he may have filed bankruptcy. I searched Mm. the index. I searched the index completely and I couldn't find him. I thought for sure he was the best candidate for it. So while I was there and I couldn't find him, I was disappointed I didn't find him. But then while I was there, I searched for every one of my other ancestors who was living at the same time. And I searched and found my third great-grandfather. His name was 
Percival Strauss, and I have copies of those, and I will make sure that you get to see them, and uh, so that your listeners can actually look at what a file looks like. And uh, with him, I never expected to find a bankruptcy file. He was always, at least that early part of his life, he was a farmer. He was just uh, a regular farmer, had land, but apparently for about a year of his life, he ran a general store, and the store went bust up. And when it did, he filed bankruptcy, and I was able to get a glimpse into his life for one year to know what his life was like and to know how much financial trouble he had gotten himself into. I mean, he had dug mm. himself a hole. <laughs> wow. Describe for us, what, what kinds of records are we going to find? Because I think this is an area that could potentially affect anybody listening. What kinds of information were you getting from this? Well, I was getting a list of his uh, creditors, all those that he owed money to. Mm -hmm. In his case, it was an entire schedule. It was Schedule A, and it was page after page of records that related to all the people that he owed money to. Now, most of these were, of course, businesses because he did have a general store. He was a merchant, at least for that short period of time, and it listed the name of the creditor. It listed the address of the creditor, where they were located, uh, physical street addresses, because a lot of them were in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And then it listed the amount of money that was owed, the debt that he had incurred. And then it listed the, the items, what the debt was over. And I was like amazed to see the information, how detailed it was, because he sold sundries and, and other types of materials and items in his store it was very specific as to what those debts were what items he bought at these wholesalers in philadelphia it was really amazing oh how interesting and then it tallied up the the cost at the end he was almost ten thousand dollars in debt in 1867 oh uh, eight, ouch 1867 dollars right Wow, that's amazing. When, when you find a record like that with a bankruptcy, is there any other logical next step? You found that packet. Was there anything else that you thought, okay, well, now I know I need to go find this? What, did it, what other kinds of records would those lead you to? Well, in my case for him, because now I had a clue that he had a business other than his farming I knew he had land. I knew he had a farm. I had found all that. But now I had a clue that he had a business. So my next step was to go locally. Now, outside of the federal records, I went locally to see if I could find a business license. Because I figured if he had a store, he had to have had a license to operate the store. And I wasn't disappointed. I had found a listing in the newspaper that listed that he had a business license, that he had paid a fee to... Uh, to have his business operate for that one year. And it gave me the township, the, the physical geographic location where he was, where his store was located, because I didn't even know that. Very cool. And see, I think that's what everybody listening can really get excited about is that, um, you know, talking about these federal records opens up a new area of records, but really records always have a trail and lead to other records. And as you were talking, I was thinking about, oh, I think I'd go check Google Books, see if his store is listed in any uh, county histories or almanacs or, you know, catalogs or that kind of thing. I found in Minnesota, there were lots of like associations of merchants. And it was surprising uh, at state levels where people would, I could find them listed because they had a little store in a little town. So it's neat to kind of see the path that one record shouldn't be the end. It can sometimes just be the beginning, couldn't it? Absolutely. And this is what I found in my case was that I was able to go to different records beyond that. Not only that, then I could also search at the, even at the local county level, as far as anything held within the county itself. Just as you had said, you know, the, these records will lead you to other records. Now, it's important to note that with bankruptcy records, nationally at least for the federal records, the National Archives last couple of years has made a real huge um, impact at moving all the bankruptcy records to one location. So they've been scattered throughout the regional branches for years and they have decided that the National Archives has now decided that they want the bankruptcy records at least to be located in one place. 
that one place where they're going to be located is going to be the Kansas City, Missouri National Archives branch. And it's going to take time. They're moving them slowly. But eventually, the whole country's bankruptcy files will be in one place. Interesting. So what do you think about that? Does that make it easier or does that make it a little more challenging? No, I think that makes it much easier because it's going to join another set of records that are at Kansas City for the country, and that's the United States patent records. Uh So if you had an ancestor who was an inventor, the patent files are also nationally kept in one spot at Kansas City. And I think it has something probably to do with the space Mm -hmm. Uh, because that office has a lot of room where some of these archive branches may not have the space. And I believe they want to, they want to, I think the National Archives is making a real attempt at putting these records together to make it easier for researchers to use. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh, where do you get into the records? Some of the ones that you're going to find are going to be amazing. I use examples, obviously, when I give this lecture. So uh, one of the examples I use, and a, a few people are even aware of this fact, In the 1841 Act of Bankruptcy, I use an example of a real person. It's not an ancestor of mine. That's the 1867 Act that I use. But did you know that Edgar Allan Poe had filed bankruptcy in 1841 from that act? Interesting. Yeah, he he was in financial trouble uh, very early on in his, uh, his literary career. Well, you know, it might be actually a really good exercise to pick a a well-known person with a known bankruptcy like that to kind of familiarize yourself with the records and kind of see how the whole thing works. So then you can really apply that to your own family. Yes, and they're all public records. So there's no restrictions on usage to be able to look at these. So in each of the four acts, I actually give an example. So in 1800, I use Robert Morris, who was a Revolutionary War financier. He was a friend of George Washington. He was a merchant. It was limited to merchants, the 1800 one. That was the only drawback to that one. Mm. In 41, I used Poe. In 1867, I used my ancestor, Percival Strauss. And then in the 1898 Act, I used Dean Martin. (laughs) Really? He filed for bankruptcy? Yes, he did. In in New York. In New York. See, it can happen to anybody. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah, and again, it's all public record. Well, anything else we should know about bankruptcy before? I wanted to certainly touch on the writs of habeas corpus, but anything else that we I maybe didn't ask you about? No. The only other thing that I might add was I did mention the 1898 Act was amended over time, mm-hmm. and that did happen. And in the uh, early 1900s, there was uh, a drafting of, of a bill uh, that occurred, and it eventually created reform in what was called the Chandler Act. And this essentially amended the earlier Bankruptcy Act of 1898, and then that rolled over in time. And in 1978, it was replaced by what's called the Bankruptcy Reform Act. And this is what we are under today. So just know that terminology and and terms and words that may have changed, but it's still really the same act that we're under. And would those different acts then mean different kinds of information is being collected, different kinds. You'll we'll see different variations. Well you may see different types of documents as far as within the file itself uh-huh. because it may, it may have a different title on the on the page, but it's really the same basic structure within the bankruptcy. Well we've covered a lot of ground in federal records, but there's so much more to talk about and we'll do that right after this. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And MyHeritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait, and there are 
billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. And now for the conclusion to my conversation on federal records with Michael Strauss. So let's talk about the writs of habeas corpus, because I know in your lecture you say that these can be found in most case files. And most of us have heard the term, but then we don't know where to go from there. What, what, is all these, what are these about? Well, the writs of habeas corpus is a, essentially a, a written writ or, or a, a document. It was used heavily during the American Civil War. So I think you have to have an understanding first of why they were written and really what they're all about before looking at them within case files of the federal records. A good example of this is found very early in the Civil War. So when the uh, southern states started to secede from the Union, uh, and there was a belief that Maryland would follow. Maryland did not, just historically did not. Mm -hmm. But there was belief that it could, because Maryland was a slave state. And it was surrounded Washington, D.C. to the north. Virginia succeeded and surrounded it to the south. And President Lincoln believed that this would have been a bad thing for both states on both sides of Washington to be surrounding them, to be secessionist states and both leaving the Union. So what he did was a number of the, of the uh, leaders, political leaders in Baltimore, were jailed and essentially their uh, rights as citizens were suspended. And this is what was referred to as the writs of habeas corpus. Their civil rights were literally suspended, and these men were thrown in jail at Fort McHenry and were released after the hostilities and after this bad period of time was over. So when you look at these files, you may see instances like this where someone's rights were literally suspended and a writ was written and placed into a file for any given reason. And that's really the essentially why they were created. How interesting. But you're saying that these are fairly common? Oh, yes, they are very common, especially when it comes to cases where also during the Civil War, when uh, you're talking about uh, when were most often used during the war for soldiers who were under the age of 18, or it also might have referred to runaway slaves. Uh, this was heavily, heavily used during the American Civil War. It really is a court order rendered from a judge. Right. And it, you know, it detained another person, essentially. And so how would you know to look for something like that? You may not know to look individually for something within there. Your better clue might be the type of file that you're looking at. If you know for a certain that it's a runaway slave case or if you know it's a case of a minor during the American Civil War, that would lead you to believe that there should be a writ included in the file. Oh, and that's where understanding the, the process, right? Right. Understanding the terminology a little bit, understanding the process and why it happened. You mentioned fugitive slaves. There was a Fugitive Slave Act, right? You talk about yes, that there in your presentation. Was. Tell us about that. Well, there was a Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. There was a previous one in 1793, which was essentially non-existent. It didn't work very well. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the latter in 1850 followed on what was called the Compromise of 1850. Now, when I use the word compromise, I'm only referring to the fact that both the southern and the northern states would compromise to avert war, to keep war from happening. This, of course, did happen 10 years later, 11 years later. But the Compromise of 1850, one of the parts of the Compromise of 1850 was a tougher Fugitive Slave Act. Now, this was passed by Congress, and this was extremely a controversial act as it allowed for runaway slaves to be returned to the f slave owners differently than it was in 1793, because this time the federal government got involved and actual U.S. Marshals would actually go and help return the slave back to their master. So that's the clue. The fact that the federal government got involved at this point, that should immediately ring bells in our head that this means paperwork. This means Absolutely. there's some kind of a trail, right? Right. Exactly right. So you would have a petition. 
an affidavit possibly listing ownership of the of the slave you would have testimony from witnesses who knew and the family directly that owned the slave that may have had personal information about that there would be documentation supporting the ownership of the fugitive slave and again all of this is backed and supported by the federal government and when we're looking for these kinds of records, are we looking at the slave holder? What names are we looking? How are we tracking these down? You're likely to be tracking these down at least as part of the slave holder's name because they're oh. the owners of the property. I see. I mean, it's their property. It's chattel. It's their property. So your it would your best bet would be to search under the slave owner's name. Okay, so that gives us a good sense. And there was another act that you talk about in that class that you present, and it's the Confiscation Act. What is that? Yes, the Confiscation Act was also during the American Civil War. Uh, I mean, it was uh, obviously the Fugitive Slave Act had a lot to do with what would become the war. But the Confiscation Act was actually during the war. Now, this was passed in 1862, passed by Congress. Uh, July 17th was the actual date. But the actual act had a longer title. It was actually called an act to suppress insurrection, to punish treason and rebellion, to seize and confiscate the property of rebels and for other purposes. That was the full title of the act. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty wordy. Let's just break it down to its simplest form. We, as the federal government, have the right to confiscate Confederate property. Mm. I can't make it any plainer than that. Mm -hmm. So this act would give power to take land and businesses of persons who owned property and had you know, money in the Confederacy. So an example of this, probably one of the most well-known examples, we all are familiar probably with Robert E. Lee, General Robert E. Lee. He would become the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia in the American Civil War. Well, Robert E. Lee lived in northern virginia and his home was confiscated so this yes. was this really only took in land that was under union control that's important to note mm -hmm. so if the union controlled that land and there was confederate property prior to that as was the case with robert e lee's home they confiscated his house and his land his property and you should see the file the file actually has an inventory of what he had in the house, yeah. right down to the furnishings. Well, and his house sits right now where Arlington National Cemetery is. I was going to say, that's where they put the cemetery, right? Yes, that is right. That was formerly Robert Lee's house. Now, see, all of the, what we've been talking about today, and I think this is what's so great about this conversation, is, is that everybody listening can hear different little things that might trigger, oh, I think there's something like that in my family. I think there was some land or there was a battle there or somebody took the land. And if we understand the acts, the laws, the things that were happening, we know that paper trails got created and that can open up this whole new avenue. And and as you said, uh, federal records creates paperwork. And if we can kind of clue into where these things touch our family's lives, we might be able to really access a whole new wealth of information, which is just really exciting. Yeah, I think so as well. Uh, besides the ones that we, we did discuss, I mean, we didn't break any deeper into a couple others, but obviously the criminal cases are going to be a huge, huge collection of records. And you could be included in there for any number of reasons, anything from uh, as as you know, from starting with, say, treason, assault and battery on the high seas, conspiracy to overthrow our government, smuggling, forgery, counterfeiting. You could carry on a business without a license. You could, you could not pay your taxes. Al Capone was indicted for not paying his taxes and sent to federal prison. They, yeah. couldn't get him on, they couldn't get him on racketeering. They couldn't get him on extortion. They couldn't get him on prostitution. They couldn't get him on murder. But they got them on taxes. You know, it's funny that you say that because I've heard that story. And it, it, they, there was somebody wrote a book, I think, once, and they said, you know, everybody pretty much breaks at least three federal laws a week. You know, and you don't even know you're doing it. I mean, there's sometimes so, more. Yeah, there are so many different ways. So, And of course, all of that means 
paperwork and records. There's Um, going to be a trail that will follow. Absolutely. And then I think probably the one other collection of records I think that genealogists will use a lot Mm -hmm. will, of course, be naturalizations. Yes. And uh, I want to I want people to understand your listeners to understand that naturalizations could kind of follow into two different funnels. You could either naturalize at the federal level, which is what we're talking about today. But you as the person who's be interested in becoming naturalized could also file your naturalization at the local level. So you could go either direction. So dependent on the person who's trying to become naturalized, they could choose one or the other. Now, if you did it locally, it's going to be in a local court, a local county record. Mm -hmm. But if the person didn't do that, it's going to be found in the federal records. And our first national act was passed by Congress in the year 1790. It was a two-part process. You declared your intention to be a citizen first, and then you filed the petition. And again, reminding you that that was an order by the court granting citizenship. So that would have been a two-step process, but those federal records of naturalization would be available to search. Absolutely, and I can attest to that. And in fact, in my great-grandfather's case, um, they came from Germany. He attempted it once back in just before 1920, and then he did it again and finally finished the process in 1940 in a completely different jurisdiction. So it's interesting. They don't have to complete the process for there to be paperwork, and it's worth a look for sure. And sometimes people that did file the first part, the declaration, never finished and and never became U.S. citizens and were aliens their entire lives. I use actually an example in my one of my lectures for naturalization. I found one that. I could not. I could not have found otherwise. I don't think any other place. I was doing uh, an, an estate forensic work. This was my regular work that I was doing, and uh, I found a naturalization for a man from New York, and his last name was Hirsch, Jacob Hirsch, and I found his naturalization record, and it looked, and it was in the federal courts, and it looked like any other naturalization record. It was a normal looking record. But what I didn't expect to find was his wife's naturalization. She naturalized after him. Now, this was typically a a package deal Mm -hmm. where if he naturalized, she would naturalize afterwards. And in the case that this was, she chose to naturalize on her own because women were given the right to vote after the year, uh, the passing of the amendment in 1920. So she chose to naturalize separately. But what fascinated me about this record was It was the same husband and wife mentioned in both. You know, it was just opposite, obviously, because she was the petitioner. And it mentioned the same three children that they had and their birth dates and their birthplaces. When I compared the two, husband and wife, neither of the two of them had the same birth dates for their kids. Really? (laughs) (laughs) They They had different birth dates for both of them. Oh, that's funny. It was clearly the same person. Right. The address was the same. The names of the husband and wife were the same. (laughs) It even mentioned in the wife's naturalization that my husband was previously naturalized. Yeah, and all the more reason why, even when you think you find, oh, here's the birth date, you need to go find other sources to back that up. because you Well, find, and that's where yeah. a birth certificate or some other record to clarify the fact that one of the two of them has the correct birth date, presumably, you know, one of them has to know you the correct think. birth date of their children. <laughs> I, I really have tried to wrap my mind around this one over the yeah. years, and the only thing that I can come up with, because they were Jewish, it's possible that the different birth dates were listed possibly because of the Jewish calendar, mm. but I don't know for certain if that's the case. That's right. the only thing that I can come up with that would have created different dates of birth. Interesting. Maybe the one used a different calendar date than the other. Who knows? And it could just be, you know, one person's memory was a whole lot better than another's, or I don't know. That's that's really interesting. Gosh, We could go on and on. And I love talking about this. I think you've really opened the doors 
for everybody listening to to really realize how one that these records apply to them and their families, but two to kind of demystify a bit of the process on how to to access them. We were talking specifically about immigration naturalization. I've actually done three episodes as part of the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast specifically on that topic. So I'm going to link to that in the show notes. So those of you thinking and hearing about this federal level naturalization process, I've got more information for you on that. And of course, we'll have links and information about all the things that Michael has been sharing with us today. So Michael, I know that when we don't have you here, you're out and about across the country. Tell us where people can find you and also maybe take some of your classes. Yes, uh, as you did mention, Lisa, I am uh, frequently out around the country lecturing at different uh, at different uh, venues all across the United States. And one of the things that uh, I will be doing, oh, and, and it might be easier to reach me at my website. My website is uh, Genealogy Research Network, and uh, there will be a link, of course, in the uh, show notes to be able to reach me. But one thing I would, uh, if you really like this stuff on federal records, and you really want to dig deeper into it, I mean, really deep into federal records, I would ask that you consider attending uh, this next year, 2020's Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy. It's uh, called SLIG, S-L-I-G, and it's a week-long, Monday through Friday, in-depth courses that are offered at Salt Lake City where these courses are held. One of the courses, course two, is my course, simply titled a guide to treasures found in federal records. So some of the stuff that I will be going over, obviously, are going to be everything from introducing the students to national archives, to the archives process, the record groups, how they're organized, naturalization, census records, U.S. tax lists, military records, Reconstruction era records, government documents, public land, bounty land, copyrights and trademarks, inventions and patents, records of the Postal Service, the Indian Affairs, federal court records, the New Deal, Bounty Land, and finally, prison records. All of this are going to be discussed during the entire week. Go onto their website and uh, look deeper at their listings of their courses. And if interested, sign up for my course. It would be well worth your time. Oh, I completely agree. And, and again, he's talking about SLIG. That's how you'll hear about it uh, out and about and on social media. It's the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy. Wow, I know, Michael, people who've taken some of these courses at SLIG and really come out feeling like they really know a particular area of research inside and out and federal records. My gosh, just the list that you had is so rich. I mean, that's just got to be tremendous. So I will have a link in the show notes so that you can follow up on that and learn more about it. And Michael's course number two, a guide to treasures found in federal records. This has just been terrific. And I am so excited to think about um, what people will be finding when they dig into federal records. Absolutely. This is like I said at the very beginning, this is a relatively untapped source. And once you tap into this, you're not going to want to stop. Well, we won't stop with you. We're going to talk to you again as soon here on the podcast. Thank you, Michael Strauss. Thank you very much, Lisa. Do you want to know a secret? You can learn the old German handwriting. Yes, you. Don't let your ancestors' stories fade as quickly as the ink on that page. Catherine Schober of SK Translations is a professional German script expert, translator, and author, and she has created the Reading the Old German Handwriting online course, so you can be reading those old German letters in just a matter of months. Complete with videos, flashcards, games, and more, this do-it-yourself course has students raving. Katie started the course frustrated that she couldn't even decipher her ancestors' signatures, and now she takes on entire records. And Don's eyes used to glaze over when he looked at his ancestors' documents. And now he sight-reads handwritten words, speeding up his research progress like never before. If you want in on what students are calling the best genealogy decision they've ever made, don't wait. For a limited time, you can save 10% on the online course, Reading the Old German Handwriting. Just use the promo code GEMSDEAL. G-E-M-S-D-E-A-L at checkout. 
So go to german-handwriting.teachable.com and I'll have that link for you in the show notes. Enter the coupon code GEMSDEAL to get 10% off and get ready to make the best decision for your genealogy research and discover what your German ancestors' records can tell you about your family history. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this Genealogy Gems podcast episode. It's number 235. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, don't miss the show notes. <laughs> we put a lot of effort into compiling those for you. And we really have outlined and detailed everything that Michael talked about today on federal record research. So that's going to come in very handy. And I have a few other important items I want to alert you to. And one is the Genealogy Roots event. Now, we just held that in Salt Lake City, Utah, And that was in October 2019. Well, we are bringing Genealogy Roots to the Senior Expo in St. George, Utah. This is going to happen in January. So it's January 2020. It's a two-day event, Tuesday and Wednesday, January 14th and 15th. Jeff Rasmussen, my special guest speaker, is coming back and he'll be joining me uh, on stage at Genealogy Roots. Now, this, again, is at the Dixie Convention Center, and that's in St. George. It's a great venue. Uh, We're going to have two full days together. And I think that that was something that we really enjoyed in Salt Lake City was we had uh, a wonderful audience where we really got to spend time together. I think I got to, to speak personally to every single person who attended. Everybody got full color spiral bound workbooks, really great with all the notes, a place to keep notes as well. Uh, We gave out beautiful branded zipper bags. Everybody had a Genealogy Roots custom zipper bag. Uh, I think Jeff handed out some copies of his book and we gave away some amazing prizes. Our wonderful, wonderful sponsor, MyHeritage. Wow, they gave us DNA kits. We must've given away about six DNA kits. And we also gave away several full, complete subscription packages for one year to MyHeritage. So really wonderful, wonderful prizes. I mean, everybody was just like on the edge of their seats. And, and um, I think walked away with a lot of really cool new ideas. Jeff had a fascinating talk on how to differentiate two people with the same name. Uh, it's a whole new program over 2018, but it is the same program that we did in Salt Lake City. So if you didn't get a chance to join us, this is your second chance. Who says you don't ever get second chances? Join us at Genealogy Roots in St. George, Utah. I'm producing the event. It's being hosted by Senior Leaf, which is now part of Deseret Digital Media. And um, they are hosting all of this together at the Senior Expo in St. George. But hey, you don't have to be a senior to attend, that's for sure. So if you want more information, go to seniorexpo.org, or you can head to the show notes. For this podcast episode, I'll have a link to get you there as well. And there's also some videos. So if you just want to have a sense of what am I getting myself into? And let me tell you, it's fun. Um, Go to the show notes and watch the videos. We have wrap up videos. They're just a minute or two, kind of showing you what we did on day one and day two. Just the energy, the presentations, Jeff, the whole thing. It was wonderful. So, oh, well, Coda just walked in and she just plopped down. Did you hear her sigh? (laughs) She hears me talking and she's like, boring. And she comes in and plops herself down. All right. Hello, Coda. Yes, she looked at us. She says hi. So uh, head to the show notes and you can watch the review videos of those two days. It'll take you about two minutes, but it'll give you a really great sense of what happens at Genealogy Roots. And I think you're going to want to be a part of it. So again, that's seniorexpo.org or the show notes for this episode. Uh, The other thing I wanted to mention to you was if you want to hear more from Michael Strauss, and wasn't he terrific today? Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Uh, If you want to hear more from him, and really more of the Genealogy Gems podcast, I got to tell you, becoming a Genealogy Gems premium member is the best way to do that. The one-year membership, it gives you full access to the exclusive premium podcast. So this is the show that's totally unique, unique topics and things that you don't hear on the regular show. It's ad-free and uh, it's only available exclusively to premium members. When you become a member, I don't think a lot of people realize you don't just get next month's episode, you get the entire archive. 
So if you enjoy the podcast, this is a no brainer. There's 175 episodes. And then you get a new episode every month, which is even better. Plus, you get access to my collection of over 50 video classes. These are on topics like Google for genealogy. We've got lots of DNA class videos, uh, records research, methodology, organization, anything that you need to know about doing genealogy and having a blast. That's what we're going to talk about in our class videos. Uh, Each video comes with a handout, just like if you were attending a conference. So if you want to learn more about that or become a member, head to the show notes for this episode and uh, you'll find a link there or you can go to genealogygems.com and under premium, select subscribe in the menu. And if you are already a member, I wanted to alert you that you can hear more from Michael Strauss. That is in Genealogy Gems Premium Podcast Episode 174. It's included in your archive. And that's where Michael talks about descendancy research, just another methodology you're going to want in your toolkit. Okay, we've filled up the hour. Coda's already fallen asleep. The snoring has begun. I've done my job. (laughs) I am so glad you joined me here. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.